This is D.B. Sweeney from The Cutting Edge, and you are listening to Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast. He told me, keep your friends close. But your enemies closer. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Good morning, Vietnam! Keep the change, you filthy animal. So you go on and stamp your form, Sonny, and stop wasting my time. Because to tell you the truth, I don't give a shit. You don't know about real loss. Because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. So if I'm not black enough, and if I'm not white enough, and if I'm not mad enough, then tell me, Tony, what am I? My name is Borat. Da, 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 da. Hey, I never asked you. Yeah. You like black bully? You're the smartest guy I ever met. And you're too stupid to see. He made up his mind ten minutes ago. That's what I do. I drink, and I know things. My next guest is an Oscar-nominated screenwriter uh, who's received nominations for Golden Globes, Academy Awards for her wonderful work in District 9. She's fresh off chasing deer in her yard. Her name is Terry Tatchell. Terry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Just to be clear, I didn't chase the deer. I, I actually left the environment so the deer could be at peace. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. I messed that up. I totally screwed up that intro. But yes, you you, you are very you are such a kind animal person. It's it's yeah. The, the deer are welcome on the property. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. My mother lives in Nevada, and, and I wish she wouldn't do this, but the deer they feed the deer because the deer like uh, they had a tough winter. And I guess, you know, she's been feeding and now it's like you pretty much have pets, right? So it's, I I, I totally get where where, where you're coming from, but um, there's so much to your story. So let me just talk a little bit. I wasn't expecting this when when I did research on your life, but I want to talk a little tea first, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So I'm a boring tea guy. I love black tea with nothing else in it. Is that maybe the worst type of tea drinker? Do you know? Do you know what's funny is we? I uh, I actually just was in London, and I, it's terrible saying this. Having a tea salon with over sixty teas, I should be drinking my own tea. But I picked up uh, Harrods English Breakfast at the airport, and I've been enjoying that with nothing in it. So I'm with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it like you first start this? Like because I've seen other interviews you've been in; they've been great to listen to and watch. And you know. You have this place you create because you know you're you're a wonderful writer. You've done all these wonderful things, but you thought it was originally going to be this place where it's like, hey, you know, my little getaway. I'll have people come in, drink their tea, do their thing. And what does it turn into into for you? For you? How does it? How is it developed for you? Um, yeah, it it did start that way. It and when it started, it started in a lot of crazy ways. One, writing can be very isolating. And I am an extremely social person and I'm a collaborative person. And when you're at the writing stage, there's no collaboration going on and there's no socializing going on. So I think part of the reason is I wanted to kind of reach out into the community and have a place within the community while I was writing. So the idea was I'd open this tea salon, it would be all wonderful, and I'd sit in the corner and I'd bang out screenplays. But of course, anybody who knows anything knows that that is not going to happen. And almost as soon as we opened the doors, it was uh, it was it was sold out all the time. So we were really really lucky. But it sort of foiled my plan. And I will not lie, there was a point three days after we opened that I was crying in the alley, thinking, "What have I done?" Because <laughs> I realize it's not just a tea salon, it's a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so forward, we're almost at six years and I have uh, an amazing manager who is just running with it now and uh, doesn't, there, there was a leak in the roof today and I did get a call about that. But uh, other than that, she uh, she's, she's handling things really well. And we've had the same chef since the beginning. So, so time has, uh, has, has, 
made it a little more self-sufficient than it may have been in the beginning. Yeah, and you know, you're in the world of randomness and irony, you're the second Canadian I've had in a week, and I swear I think you're both from the same area, too, so it's, oh. so it's just so ironic. Uh, she's an actor named uh, Leah Karens. She was an interstellar and a bunch of other things. She's from North Vancouver. Is that near you or my way off? It, North Vancouver is pretty close. It is. It's across two bridges, but it is. It is very close, and it's an area where a lot of a lot of film people live in North Vancouver. It's a popular popular area. I, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say in the last couple of months, I've had many, not many, but Canadian actors and so forth. Uh, I'm going to say the, the the rumor about Canadians being nicer than most people is true. I, I, I'm just going to go on record as saying that. <laughs> That's funny. My daughter's at university in Nashville right now, and she says that uh, that that they're pretty they're they're up there. Maybe nicer than Canadians. Maybe they, maybe that's a Nashville thing. I don't know. So so, I, so I've told you I've watched a lot of your interviews, and and one thing that I wish the interviewers did with you is kind of dig a little bit, right? Because you went to Vancouver Film School. I want to know where your love of writing comes from because I feel like I didn't hear that from any of the interviewers, and that's not a slight on them. Um, They were asking great, great questions. I just – where does it come from, Terry? Because you're clearly capable, uh, beyond capable. It's where does it come from for you? I know know you went to the film school, but take it from there. Where where, where does it stem from for you? I mean it's – I think probably with any writer, it's – it was there from as far back as I can remember. I mean I was very lucky to be read to every night. And when I wasn't being read to, I had records that were had stories on them that I just listened to incessantly. And I was an only child growing up. So I read a lot. We, we traveled a lot like on car road trips. And I w- was lucky enough that I didn't feel sick when I read in the car. So I read so much growing up or was read to or, or was taken to plays. And I was just very immersed in story from a young age and just absolutely fell in love with story. I mean, whether it's, it's movies or I was telling someone the other day, the ridiculous, uh, when I look back at my old diaries in grade six, I reviewed movies in my diary. (laughs) (laughs) How cool is that? (laughs) It's kind of embarrassing. There should have been better stuff going on. (laughs) But, uh, so yeah, no, it's always been about story. And then I went to university right out of uh, school thinking I was going to be a lawyer and, uh, just kept taking every children's literature class that I could, whether it was in the education, like every elective was children's literature. And I realized I had this huge, huge passion for children's literature, whether it's picture books or even young adult novels, like just absolutely love that and which I think is probably even though my films are R-rated I think the children aspect of it is it is reflected in those a little bit um and I thought after a flash forward a little bit did a few careers thought I'm going to write children's books and then I don't know what happened but there was this contest going on for uh write a screenplay and get free get free admission to Vancouver Film School if you win this international competition and so I bought how to write a screenplay in 21 days and tried my hand at a screenplay and sent it in and and I won so then I went to Vancouver Film School and thought wow, wow, I just fell in love with screenwriting, the formula, the freedom within the form, like just everything. And then I lost my path from children's writing for a while and I've only recently found my way back there. Um, you know, you mentioned an innocence and, and, and believe me, that's a huge point when it comes to your career and your life because there is an innocence and in, in, in you're, you're writing about children's books and you're writing about animals and even you're writing about Chappie. There's an innocence there that it's not just circumstance. It's there, it's beautiful, and it's clearly something you're very, very good at writing about. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, so how big was the, the film school for you? Do you feel like you could have been where you are today without it? You know, it. what was really big for me was somebody – it was more – getting the scholarship. It was the fact that somebody said, we see talent. Right, right. Enough that we're willing to let you go to our school for free. And that, to me, gave me the courage because, I mean, let's face it, screenwriting, if you don't grow up with knowing people that, I mean, it's different now, but at the time, I didn't know anyone who did film or anything like that. And saying, oh, well, I'm going to do that just seemed very... 
I don't know, ridiculous pipe dream. I would not have, I, there is no question I would not be writing today had that not happened. I mean, I'd be writing, but I wouldn't, wouldn't have written films had they not had the faith in my abilities to take a chance on me. And for that, I will be forever grateful. How often do you, um, and I have another question similar to this down the road, but like, how often do you wa- li- um, either watch or read other screenwriters, whether it's Quentin Tarantino, uh, Taylor Sheridan, Christopher Nolan, Wes Anderson, wh- Coen Brothers, whoever, do you pay attention to what other screenwriters do, or is it kind of like, yeah, when the movie comes out, I'll watch it, or, or what have you, but I- I- I'm going to do my own thing regardless? I'm very much I'm going to do my own thing. Um, however, I, and in fact, I look forward to other people's things probably the same way you do. Like I, it's like a fangirl kind of thing, like like so excited to see what the yes. evolution of their yep. career in mind. So, yeah, it's strictly as an excited, giddy kid before Christmas kind of sense to it. What I do read a lot of because I'll I'll. Um, I know a lot of people that are sort of up and coming uh, and I love nothing more than to read. Well, there's other things I love more, but I do like to read their drafts and give notes and help out where I can. So the scripts that I actually read are not necessarily the ones that are of Tarantino and, and it's, but I, I do read a lot of people's scripts that I know friends and I'm going to jokingly pat myself on the back because I had a screenwriter up on my show this year before the Academy. He ended up winning. Um, by the way, you should have won. Um, and I'm going to pat myself that I feel like my podcast is a magnet for greatness. And you're the perfect example of that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I can stroke my ego and yours at the same, at the same I, time. I like that. <laughs> That's always good. Okay, so before we get into you, there's something I've been dying to like tell you, right? I feel okay. like so I have two questions. One's going to lead to the other. Do you feel that – is it – could you – do you feel like – is it tough being a team with your husband? Your husband, for those of you listening, is Neil, who's a, Blancam, who's a director. Do you feel that – is it difficult to be – to have a – and this is – I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds here. To, to, to have a personal relationship and a profession – is it tough to do that? Because you're clearly a phenomenal team, right? So is it tough to manage both? Is it – like when you guys have disagreements, is it like I, – I don't see it that way. I see it this way. How, how uh, difficult is it – that whole that whole atmosphere of, of, of things that you have to consider? Oh, it's really difficult. I'm not yeah. going to lie. It's, it's extremely challenging to the point that like at the end of District 9, I think he fired me three times. He gets really <laughs> angry if I say that. He says, he says that's not true and he didn't and I'm making things up. But in my memory. <laughs> um, so at the end of District 9, we're like, okay, that was the, the end product was great and I'm so glad we collaborated on it because there's, there's pieces of both of us in there, Right. but that was a horrible experience. We're never doing that again. And then he, he, I mean, there's always story ideas being daily pitched around our house. And, uh, he, when he, he pitched Chappie and I begged him to work on that with him because I just loved the sounds. I just really wanted to work on it with him. So we did it again and that was actually fine. That wasn't a problem. Um, and then, then we kind of said we weren't going to again. And now recently, like right now, we're working on two things together, two kind of secret projects. And it's been really uh, – it, it's difficult to find the, your footing on that because I think that – I mean, especially in one, he wasn't necessarily a director on it. If he's a director on it, then – I have come to learn that there's a hierarchy and I have to respect the director's vision. Right. Uh, but if he's not the director on it, then that's where we're really in trouble because then that gets confusing and then you get the, the yeah. So our, our solution to that actually is that we don't ever work face to face. We only work by email. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. I, I never would have pictured it that way. And I got to say, I, he is, and I've been dying to say this to you because I know you guys are. You guys do make, however it comes down, you make for a great team. But I feel like he's ridiculously hard on himself because I love District Nine, I love Chappie, and I love Elysium. And I'm not just saying this oh, because of speak, but he is. I've been dying. I said this to. I had an act, a South African actor. Uh, his last name is Lee, and I can't think of the first name. But we were talking about this in a very positive way. I really feel like. Neil is very hard on himself. When it came to Chappie, yeah. 
it's not his fault that audiences don't get his vision because his vision was awesome. It came across awesome. Um, Elysium, he, you know, he was hard on himself with the storytelling. I didn't see the flaw there. I, I mean, but I guess that's what makes him a phenomenal director is that he's always looking to become better. But, be, you know, Terry, between you, I, and, and everyone else listening, I just feel like he's ridiculously hard on himself. I think that's probably a characteristic of, of many, many artists, sadly. That's true. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think it is. But yes, he is definitely uh, always, I, I think that, I, I think that he is definitely really proud of his body of work for sure. Um, as he should be, but yes, he, like most artists, I think can be, can be rather, rather hard on himself. Yeah. I think it was, um, yeah, I think it was Chappie. He was very proud. He's very proud of everything, but he's very proud of Chappie, but it's not, you know, he painted a perfect picture. You guys, both of you painted a perfect picture. It's not your fault if, if an audience and, and the reviews, when I'm looking at IMDb there, people love it, but it's for the people that don't love it, you love it or you hate it, which I get, that makes sense to me. Well, it totally makes sense to me, and I'm okay with people loving it or hating it. If everyone was wishy-washy on it, I think that would hurt more. Right. But but, but here's where I get really upset, and, and I'm going to make a, an analogy of something that came out very recently. Because you may not agree with something or because you, you see a story unfolding in another way, the movie was created beautifully. It deserved more accolades than it received. I look at Game of Thrones. People have this different vision and therefore make a judgment on their vision. And I think that's a little bit what happened with Chappie. And it's, it's not fair to the actors, the director, the writers, the, the crew, the people involved. I just, it's a very skewed perspective, Terry. And I'm, I'm just not okay with how fans are handling movies and show these days. And, yeah. and, and I, I'm a little heated about this, so I, I apologize for being over the top. Well, of it's kind of fresh with Game of Thrones, the way people responded. Like the first thing I said, Terry, was when I got on Twitter, I said to the writers, I said, thank you. Like, how about yeah. a thank you? Like, no. they, they've, they've entertained you for, you know, years and years, and we have petitions going. Like, people have lost their mind. TV has never been better. Movies have never been better. Yeah. And people have lost their collective minds, theory. No, it's true. It's It was I, – I actually couldn't believe the stuff I was reading. I, I don't normally – go down the rabbit hole of social media, but I did in this instance. And I was, and it, it's hard, like being someone who's worked on things. It's like, it, it hurts even more because you know how much they put into it, but it's, yeah, it can, it, it, it can get me pretty heated too. And that, that one, because that just happened. And like, I, be, be grateful. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and it kind of, when, when, when the, I think these, Neil made these like a while ago, uh, you know, but, but it broke my heart that he felt that he had to justify, not justify, but it's like, it's not your, like he creates, you guys as a team create a beautiful product. And it's, if people don't get your vision, that's on them. That's not on you. I mean, that that's just how I feel anyway. But um, yeah, yeah no. it, it, we have lost perspective as fans. When somebody wants to tell a story, enjoy the story. You can comment, you can disagree, but either way, just respect the process. I think that's the way I would approach yeah. it. No, I agree. Oh, okay. So as a writer, let's just take Chappie, right? So you have a wonderful cast, right? Um, yeah. How, what's the proper way to – is it is it Charlotte Copley? Is that how you pronounce the name? Copley. Copley. Charlotte Copley. Charlotte Copley. Yeah. yeah. So, so Neil discovers him and he is maybe one of the best actors on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. When you have an actor like him, like uh, Dev Patel and, and Hugh Jackman and Sigourney Weaver, does your writing – like does your writing change at all or when you write, does it – is it just, you know what, this is the content of what I want to put forward? Does it ever – Linger. The script was in place before the casting, right? Okay. With the exception of Ninja, and, and uh, we knew they that they were there in there. But other than that, we didn't know. I'm trying to remember. Did we know that Charlotte was going to be Chappie? I can't think. I mean, Chappie was Chappie in my head, even though Charlotte brought him to life so wonderfully. Um, so. But had I known Sigourney Weaver and like that probably would have thrown me for a loop. Right. That's uh, I have such huge, enormous respect for her. She's incredible. And I probably would have um, agonized, agonized horribly knowing that I was writing anything for her to say or do. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I mean, because the writing happens early, 
No, I don't think so. I think if anything, it's helpful. I'll often, when I write things, pretend it's Charlto in my head just because <laughs> I know how he would execute characters pretty well. So sometimes it's, 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 I just did an adaptation, uh, Apocalypse Now Now, which is an adaptation of a South African book. And I doubt Charlto will be in it, but I wrote one of the characters as if it was him. <laughs> yes, yes. And, 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 and that's well said. And one, one of the things that, you know, I, I I told you Neil's perspective on Chappie. Um, what's your perspective on Chappie? I love Chappie. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, of course, was a little bit gutted when the reviews started coming out. Um, but I, I love Chappie. I'm proud of Chappie. And I'm super proud of Neil for, I mean, all I had to do was co-write it. I didn't, I, it, it was shot the same time I was opening Neverland. So I was only on set for a little bit. I, I really didn't, I mean, I got to see the, uh, the the everyday modern technology now footage would get sent to Vancouver for me and I got to see that but um I I didn't feel I think I watched it more as uh being proud of the other people that put it together than as something of my own and I'm super proud of what everybody did in that film I I I love that film no, I, I, you and I are in the same are, are on the same page on that and, and one of the things that I, I I really wanted to ask you is you know we, we talk about these movies, but I'm going to tell you, like when I look, I, I feel like there's people that hate just to hate, but that's a, I guess, a conversation for another time. But all the the work that you and Neil put into these movies, um, I feel like it gets a, an obnoxious amount of votes. Like we're talking seven hundred thousand people voting three hundred thousand, and you don't see that with a lot of movies. So people are clearly invested in what you and Neil are doing. Yeah, I, I think people are invested in what Neil's doing for sure, absolutely, which is uh, which is valid. I'm invested in it too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your work is—I mean, people don't realize how hard how hard your job is. And the writing's the foundation of every movie. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, yes, there's other aspects, but your work is is clearly important. I mean, I absolutely and, and, and much like <clears throat> your work, well, which we'll get to in a moment, your your, your children's work. Um, I, I, all three of those movies brought, I mean, I love them. I, I own all three of them. I watch them quite a bit and you know, it's, they're three phenomenal movies. And you know, when it comes to like each of those, um, I, I know Neil has, as a way of, you know, like we said, we talked about Charlto has a way of like just believing in an actor. Um, Ninja is kind of the same way. I don't feel like people in the States know Ninja really well, unless they've seen mm -hmm. Chappie. There's so much, and, and you can say whatever you want, whether you want to get deep into it, or you want to stay on the surface, that's fine. There's so much of a mixed bag around him. Um, what, what are your takes on Ninja? Is it Yolandi? Is that the, the, the woman? Yolandi, yeah. Okay. So what is your take? I mean, I have an actor coming on who was in Chappie, Brandon, um, all right, who's a fantastic guy. And oh, I, yeah. He yeah. was also in East Ham. Yes. He's a great, great actor. And I, he's actually in District 9. And he's got a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful look in, in, in Chappie. Um, he doesn't, if I asked him this question, I feel like my, his ears would explode. <laughs> or my, so I'm going to ask you the question, say whatever you want. Don't say anything at all. W what's your take on that? My, my take on is I met uh, Ninja and Yolandi in Vancouver. They came to play and I met them behind the scenes and really it was, it was great meeting them. And, uh, uh, and then I met them again on set and they were huge champions for Chappie getting Chappie made. They were really excited about it to the point that Yolandi got a Chappie tattoo on her, on her shoulder before we even knew it was going to get wow. greenlit. Um, so they, they were really, really, really behind it in a really positive, great way. And I, when I watch it now, I watched it not too long ago because you don't watch your own stuff. There's big gaps. Then you almost get to watch it fresh. And I think they did the most amazing job. And I think they brought 150% to the performance. And I just, I, 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 like I said, I love Chappie and Chappie would not, Chappie wouldn't even exist without them because they were the whole idea in the first place right so i i'm i'm a fan i think they did a really really great job no i i agree i agree and what happens offset i can't comment on but as far as performance what i see as a fan i, I mean i love i i love those three mm -hmm. movies and uh and i've told you off the air I'm, I'm i'm a little emotional when it comes to things i see on twitter or or even like a like a, 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 a these three movies i mean i was in tears and i think all three like 
fantastic performances. Um, in some cases with fans, we've talked about this a little under, maybe a lot underappreciated. Um, but you know, when, when you have movies like this, I mean, they really cut to your core. Like you see it and, and you know, I'll talk about Chappie, but it's just, he's just, he, he's like, he's a child growing up and you don't expect it to hit you the way it does. At least that's my perspective. I mean, yeah. I, when I was in the theater and I watched this, I'm like, I, I turn around, people are wiping their faces. Like, Aww. I don't know. That's what, that's what great, that's what great art, that, that's, that's art. That is what, that's what going to the movies is all about. Isn't it, Terry? Yeah, no. Oh, I, there's nothing better than being moved. I love that. Yeah. No. So thank you. That's a huge compliment. So there's, there's a lot with what you're doing. You know, we, we talk about, you know, um, your work and, and, and Neil's work. Uh, we talked about, you know, working together. Um, do you guys, w- w- if there's ever such thing, because I know you're both very busy, you have many ventures, he has a lot going on. Is there ever such thing as a movie night with you two? Oh, yeah, almost every night. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. No, we, we, do, we yeah, we, we love our movie nights. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, at home, always, a lot of the time. And then when we actually get a chance to go to the, go out together and it's like I am giddy like a child like I and he is too it's we were honestly like it gets so excited no we we love 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 movie nights and around Oscar season around Christmas you get the screeners and we're both voters so we uh it's like that's what kind of Christmas is at our house is like watching screener after screener <laughs> after screener after screener yeah we definitely have movie nights <laughs> uh, uh, would you so so my next question is can you separate the you know the writer from the fan can he separate the director from the fan like can, are you guys able to watch movie and, and, and this is really kind of it's some people can't they so athletes when they watch film cannot can never be a fan they're always picking things apart not that you no. guys are judgmental i'm not saying that but can you separate no. the for me i it was funny when i went to film school there was about a year there where i couldn't watch a film without seen oh oh yes oh oh yeah that's what I learned there that's what and I am so grateful that that went away because I am honestly not the, the if if it's something I would like to analyze professionally uh then I would want a second viewing which I mean will often happen but the first time I watch something it is as I was when I was in grade six writing in that diary like I want I there's no way I could be cheated of that pleasure because that is such a huge gift to be able to sit down and lose yourself in a story like that. So, no, I am very grateful that I've managed to not watch as a filmmaker. Terry, something you've seen of late that has moved you that you were really blown away by, is there anything that comes to mind right away? Oh, I have a terrible memory for these things. What if I – I mean, I uh, – it's – my daughter was – we just did a – uh, we did two nights in a row of watching. Um, yes, and I was moved by it. We just watched uh, Dead to Me. Oh, and, very cool. Yes, yep. Yep, and there is some Christina Applegate in there talking about uh, how her husband responded to her double mastectomy, knowing that she's actually had that happen. Like, I'm just talking about it right now, I'm getting goosebumps. That if that's not like moving cinema, even though it's a TV series, I don't know what is like that. Absolutely. I actually just watched that last night and that was the performances in that. Amazing. Yeah. No. So I would have to say that was my most recent viewing. Holy man. Am I like feeling something there? Um, I have no. to I have to tell you, and you can file this way because I hate when people do this to me. But I promise, my my average is batting a thousand. Uh, Ricky Gervais has because I I think you're somebody that would appreciate this. It's also on Netflix. It's called Afterlife. I think you would absolutely fall in love with it. But that's oh really okay. Yes. I'm writing it. So right. so, so let, let me ask you what what is and this is kind of a little bit personal. But what does your daughter have like what what is what is her take on all of this? How does she? How does she process all of this? Because she's got two extremely talented parents, two wonderful, loving parents. How does how does she process all this? She's she's kind of a little force to be reckoned. I shouldn't say a little force. <laughs> got to stop saying that. She's, um, she's a musician, and wow. she is one of those. She was one of those kids that by I don't know four 
could hear a song on the radio and all of a sudden run over to the piano and just play it without ever having had a piano lesson. Wow. Um, so she's got her own thing going on. And uh, so when the three of us are hanging out together, it's, it's, it's like crazy creative. And even though it's different things we're all interested in and doing, it's the same in a way. And I mean, everything's so intermingled now. And, uh, so no, she is definitely, and it's not, I I don't think she, like I used to think, Oh, if you're doing all this, are you going to be making your daughter think she has to achieve things, which wouldn't sit well with me at all. And it's not, it's not like that. She, but she, as she's growing up seeing that it's okay to take risks and it's okay to be criticized. I think Chappie was a good, really good learning thing for her because she saw the reviews come in not so great. And she saw that, guess what? It's like, it's fine. <laughs> Worst case scenario, people say they don't like something. You just, fine. you're fine. You just go on and do something else. And that I think she grew up seeing that you need to be proud of yourself based on how you feel about what you did, not based on what other people say about what you did. And what, so, yeah, what she also saw was mom and dad absolutely still loving what they put forward, knowing, you know, what people think isn't always the final measure of what a product is worth. For sure. For sure. So I think that, I mean, and she's also, yeah, she's, she's, it, it, she definitely had an interesting, interesting childhood. And, uh, but I think that so far it seems to me that it's, uh, it's Neil and I are kind of, maybe it's because we were together before district nine happened, but life is really like we, it, we could be a bank teller in a bank. Like it's pretty normal. <laughs> right. And I think that has probably been really good. It's pretty grounded. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. And I asked this question. I mean, something tells me too that your no how no family on the face of the earth is perfect. But something tells me your household is 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 fun to be in. It's a very positive environment. <laughs> it is. It is fun. It's, yeah, fun has definitely been a word that uh, I, I remember having a job inter getting a job, and it was an, it was in a law firm and as a legal secretary. And the guy said that hired me said, you know, I got to tell you, I phoned three references and I asked them for three words to describe you. And I got different words, except one word each person said, and it made me think maybe I shouldn't hire you, but I decided to take a risk. And that, that word was fun. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. You know, you, we've been talking about, you know, people's perception and so forth, kind of a little bit in the interview and, I have to say the other screenwriter I had was Nick Vallelonga who won the screenplay for Green Book. And he took a ridiculous amount of, of grief for, for that movie. And I don't know. I just feel – and I'm not going to harp on this. Once I, I love that film. I did too. And he just – because I talked to him. And he – what he did was he, he really did his research. And, and long story short, it, it came across as like people were implying this and implying that. But he, he wasn't a guy that just made stuff up. He really – his dad told him things. He talked to the actual people involved. And, you know, it's just – I don't know what it is, Terry. I feel like people just love to troll, love to hate just for the sake of hating. And that hurts me. That, that, that bothers me a lot. I think – actually, it was Sigourney Weaver who told me. She's like, don't ever, ever, ever read reviews. Why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> uh, and, and I'd be remiss if I let Cha- – I'd be remiss if I let Chappie go without mentioning Han, without mentioning Hans Zimmer, who's like oh, Beethoven, yeah. right? At this point, how lucky were we for that? I know that's amazing. So, so how does that play? So, when when you and Neil say, "Oh my God, we have we've reached out," or I don't know how that works, but you get Hans Zimmer, and mm-hmm. he there's no such thing as a bad Hans Zimmer score ever. Uh, it's never existed. <laughs> how, does that as as filmmakers as writers? Do you feel like? Wow, this because I'm telling you right now, there's a, there's a funny thing, and I brought this up before. When you there's a star there, on YouTube, there's Star Wars without the music with John Williams, and it's yeah. so it's yeah. so bland. <laughs> and and Chapp, yeah. Chappie does drive really well with this music behind it. Um, yes. How important is that to you or Neil? How do you guys view that part of it? That is, I mean, that was amazing to me. I actually got to go sit in on a session. 
And it was, it, it was like, I don't know, Charlie's chocolate factory or something. Like it was the most magical place with, with all these instruments and people and rooms full of stuff. I don't even understand. And, uh, just this passion, playful passion for what's being created. So yeah, that to me is, I mean, and as a writer, that's not anything I have any say in at all. Right. right. Um, so that to me is, and that was an enormous gift. But also I remember when I first met Neil, he taught me how to edit and he showed me just like, just, we just filmed someone walking down the street. And then he showed me laying down different music over that person walking. And I mean, that was my lesson there that just the impact that that could have. Wow. And it, it's, yeah, it's pretty, so to have Hans Zimmer scoring Chappie was amazing. So, so, so there's this girl from the Vancouver Film School I've been talking to for 40 minutes. She, so she's nominated for an Academy Award uh, for District 9. Are, are you pinching yourself? Are you like, really? Like, I mean, not that it was so deserving, but what's your mental state at this point? Are you like, oh, okay, that's great. Or are you like, oh, my God. What but is, it was if, honestly, it was so absurd that it's hard to believe it's true. Like I like the movie reviews. I, I grew up watching the Oscars and I grew up doing the little ballot before. And I did like, so, um, yeah, no, it was completely, completely. So I actually, no joke said to Neil, probably when we were looking at the first edit of district nine, I said, jokingly, well, this isn't going to be our Oscar nomination. <laughs> um, so I like to think that brought us actually good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but is it is it so so Terry is it like a is it like a knockout punch I mean are you expecting it is it like oh my is it is I don't want to say hitting the lottery because that's luck and what you guys did was skill but is it is it is it does it come out of nowhere It definitely I mean it well the way the awards season goes is uh the Oscars are last so the first one that we got nominated for, I can't even remember the order, that, but before the Oscars, there had been a Golden Globe nomination and a BAFTA nomination and all, all of the awards actually. And each time I was like, are you really seriously? So the morning that they were doing the reading out the Oscar nominations, I thought, OK, I shouldn't wake up because you have to wake up early to hear it. And because that's just super cheeky and thinking that I'm going to be nominated, which is ridiculous. But that's so that I, I didn't, I didn't tell Neil, I very quietly snuck out of bed and, and went and listened and that, that, that listening, I'll never forget listening. Cause first of all, the fact that we got nominated for writing was amazing, but what really, really, really floored me and made me break out the Baileys was that, <laughs> was that the, it got nominated for best picture. And to me, that was the most amazing thing because that recognized every single person that had poured so much into that film as it was like a massive collaboration and people worked so hard on that film. And so that, that to me was the, the big deal that day. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's, it's a beloved film and, it, it, and there's no coincidence that all three of these films have such a beautiful heart to them, right? That in, in their own different way. And it's a lot like you're writing. I mean, I, I talked to you a little bit about this off the air. I, I was looking at you know snippets of your of your children's book, and I think you're onto something really great here, Terry. You want to talk a little bit about that? Thank you. Yes, I would love to talk about that. I'm like, it's my. I don't recall being this excited about something. Me either. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a series of children's books, and they're children's picture books, and it's called the series is called Endangered and Misunderstood. And the first three books in the series are going to be on African animals that are endangered and also misunderstood. And they are, they're children's picture books and they're, they're rhyming in some kind of Dr. Seuss-esque way. And they're stories about the animals that are kind of funny, but they're serious because these are animals that people don't necessarily know exist that are not going to be on our planet any longer. So I kind of, my idea was to make the stories s beloved um, and applicable to people's lives at the same time, but also about the animal and make people aware, get these animals known. And then also it's uh, it, it, each book will raise money for the animal of the book. Mm. And so each book will go, the money will go to a different charity which I've had a lot of 
fun and interesting times researching where the best place to go, assuming people buy the book, um, where it'll go for that. So it's, so I'm doing three in Africa and I think I'm going to do, uh, I was going to do three ocean animals next, but I think it'll be three Australian animals next actually. And I told you this off the air. It, it is about the treatment of these animals, and you had such a great tweet. I, I don't know if you retweeted it or, but it was in your in your timeline. But it's it's the amount of these beautiful animals that we're losing every day, and it's like talk about bringing somebody to tears. It's just so heartbreaking to see that stuff, Terry. Yeah, no, it is really hard. And I, I mean, I am an animal fanatic, and I've always been. I've tried to do documentaries. I've started. And researched about animal communications and relationships and this and that. And I always get so depressed that I can't do it. And so this was my way. I finally found a way of approaching a really serious, devastating topic with humor, which sounds kind of twisted and weird, but it's, it's a, it's a way I think it's a way in. And like the last page in the books is going to be ideas for kids on how to help what they could do. Mm. And there's going to be on the website, there's going to be, you know, study guides for teachers. If they're going to show, read the book in class and, and ideas for parents on activities or, or birthday parties that are raising money for the animals or just different things that way. Is there, what age level would you throw on these books or is it kind of like, you know what? appreciation of, of this is, is universal. Well, I have to admit, I have like a shelf full of kids picture books. So <laughs> I know I should be saying, Oh, it's from two to six or whatever. It's supposed to be at that age. But I, my, my hope is that, that, I mean, the illustrations are so beautiful. Um, I waited a year to get the illustrator that I wanted. Wow. And, uh, so I'm hoping that this is a book that adults will buy for themselves, but I may just be weird that I buy myself children's books. <laughs> you know, I, I asked you that question, Terry, and it's like one of the books I quote most often in my life is where the red fern grows. And that's quote unquote, a fourth grade book. But I'm yeah. going to tell you the message in that book, it, it's, it's adult, you know, it's, it's, it applies to anything. And you, with your books, my goodness, I mean, you should give out your social media information because you have a very beautiful pinned tweet that I, I that blew me away. I was really, I, I'm like, if this is what this these books are about, people are in store for something special. Oh, thank you. They are, uh, it, it's funny, I started, uh, I started the social media stuff a couple months ago and uh, it, then I was told I'm sharing too much. Because I've uh, part of the thinking process on these is I went to the London Book Fair and I thought, okay, do I want to traditionally publish these? Do, should I approach a publisher? And sitting through many, many talks at the London Book Fair, I decided that it's very much like film. And no, I do not want to hand these to a publisher. I want to control them and the money and so that there would be more money to send to the charities and that I could put them out at the pace I wanted. So I actually started a small publishing company with a friend of mine that was putting out some books and uh, that's Fueling House Press. And so they, I'm going to be doing it myself. So when I hired a company to help me with the marketing, they looked at my social media and they're like, stop it, stop it. What are you doing? You're giving it all away. So they've made me stop the social media. On. <laughs> but I, it will, it will once, once I've gotten their approval and their understanding on how much I'm allowed to give away. It's why Neil was shouting at me too. He's like, stop it. You're giving it all away. You're too excited. Uh, so, but it, endangered and misunderstood currently does have an Instagram and a, and a Twitter. Uh, but it's, it's gone silent until I'm, I'm schooled on how much to give away. And, and you, you might've mentioned this. And if you did, I, I apologize, but where can people get these books? Cause they're, they, they're, they're so promising and fantastic. And I love what I see here. Where can they get them? If you, if you didn't already mention it. Uh, yeah, they are, they're, they're not going to be coming out now because again, I've decided to do them myself. So I'm learning as I go, right. they will probably be available Worst case scenario, November, they will definitely be sold on Amazon. I am giving myself this time until then to do a bit of legwork and try and get them in bookstores myself, which when you self-publish or indie publish, that's not necessarily a given right away. 
So I think I need to go around and spread the word about the charitable component about them and see how many places that I can get them. But 100% Amazon, they will be on for sure. And, and, and I'll tell you that I, I am – where I live is about six or seven miles from Dr. Seuss's childhood home in the museum. Oh. Yeah, and, and I got to say watching oh. some of what you have, it kind of brought me back to – it's not Dr. Seuss-ish in the sense that it's you know over the top. What I love about yeah. this, it's very, you know, it's a lot like we talked about this before, right? It's it's very, it's it's the message that people, the kids can get through this, is is limitless, and that's what I really love about what you're doing here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the first book is about the I I, which is an endangered lemur in Madagascar, and uh, he is actually uh, he's pretty scary looking. He's a nocturnal one, and uh, it's believed that if you see him. Uh, you death will come to the village. So he's actually killed on sight. So the story about him is is him getting sent away from the village because he's always scaring people and pulling pranks. And then he, he sort of comes back and thinks about what he might be doing, the way people are perceiving him, which obviously isn't true in real life to the poor I. I. But uh, And he, he learns how to be kind and, and help people with his creepy hands that he has. and And so... It's it's hopefully it's a lesson that also applies to the playground. So I had two more questions for you, if you don't mind hanging on for two more. You've been so kind. You almost gave me an hour of your time. Thank you so much, Terry. Oh, I love talking to you. It's been great. It's so so I have to say, is am I reaching when I say there's the same heart in your writing when it comes to Chappie or these beautiful books about endangered species? Um, is there is there a same is there a commonality here, or am I reaching and, and just finding a coincidence, or is it are you coming from the same place? You know, someone told me once that uh, very early on that when you write, you always write with one theme, and I remember being so mad at that, saying that's ridiculous. I'm going to write so many different things. I'm never writing with one theme, and it occurred to me the other day. It's like, oh no, it's true. I always write about some kind of oppression. And it's like these animals that I'm choosing to feature are not only are they oppressed because they're endangered, but it's the underdog of the endangered animals. So Mm. it's the oppressed of the oppressed. So clearly, for whatever reason, that is something that I uh, I I, that uh, that touches me. It's not that I relate to it because I don't feel like I've ever been horribly oppressed um, at all. But I think it's maybe being exposed to stories and history and realities at a fairly young age that made me this just baffled me i didn't understand and i think i tried to understand it so much that it just got into my psyche and that my stories generally generally touch on that you know and whether i'm watching shark tank or in general or just you know just reading it seems like everyone thinks that they can write a children's book these clearly set themselves mm-hmm. apart. Like there is such, there's such a innocent is innocence an over the top word. I don't know. I just and I love where the profits are. I mean, I, I love everything about this entire project. I am so hoping that this wow. takes off for you. Thank you so much. That means that means a lot. I feel I feel pretty strongly about these books. I'm pretty proud of them. So my last question, I won't probe you. You say what you can say because we've all we've also established in, in this interview that Neil and the rest of the world feel like you share too much. What are your fu- <laughs> what are, what are your future projects? What do you have going on that you can share? Anything you can tell me, I would I would appreciate. Well, I, like I said, I'm working on, uh, well, there's an endangered and misunderstood series and which I'm doing under the, the new imprint of Fielding House Press. Um, always working on my tea salon. And then I'm actually working on a novel, working on a novel. And, uh, and then Neil and I are working on two screenplays together that, that, that I would definitely not be able to share what they are, but that I'm extremely excited about. Can you cough if one of them is District 10? All right, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but I, I have to say, you know, whatever. I just think that you guys make for one hell of a team, and I am just, I'm so happy that I live in a time where I get to watch artists like you and artists like Neil do their thing, and just, it's just such a wonderful time to be alive and just be happy and and enjoy what these what creators like you bring forth to kids, to people my age. Um, Terry, thank you for for all of it, and thank you for coming on today. 
Well, thank you. It's been such a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. And thank you also for your enthusiasm about the books. That really, really means a lot. Her name is Terry Tatchell. Terry, I hope you come on down the road. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today.